BMD is designs is what I've been using as my logo. But let's just get straight into this because I got a lot of stuff. So my inspiration and influences throughout my life has been like first thing Japanese architecture. I've always liked the simple, clean lines and the way that the doors open up right into nature and they create um, an inside outside thing that really brings nature into their houses. Um, Andre Charles Boulle in the uh, 17th century and 18th century. This is the height of um, technical excellence in furniture design. It's not exactly my style, but in terms of technicalities, it's just amazing. And over here we have um, Jacques Emil, uh, Emil Jacques Ruhlman. Um, this is the 1920s and 30s. So this would have been Regency. This one here is um, Art Deco. So Art Deco is basically the modern version of Regency in that it's using the really high quality materials and um, really high technical um, abilities to produce some really great stuff. Eileen Gray down here, I'm not such a big fan of her designs, but I like her because of what she represents. This here is a, a chair that looks like it could be from the 1950s or 60s, but this was designed in the 1920s. It's just a reminder that no matter what you'd want to create, somebody else has done it first. And so just keep that humbleness when you're designing things because you're just creating something for somebody else or you're creating something for yourself, but you just want to make something pretty. Don't try to change the world. At least I'm not going to. You can try to change the world. Uh, this one here has worked in Eschrick. Um, he's a post, no, not really. It's just say he uh, first uh, furniture that I saw that had organic forms and shapes to them. Before then, it was so highly technical and well designed to within an inch of its life that there's a, sometimes not a lot of life into it. But this one takes into consideration the the nature of wood and uses that to make uh, interesting designs. Sam Malouf right here, he's part of the post-World War II craft movement. Uh, this is his really famous chair, which he, he, he's dead now, but he made for a long time and he's given them to presidents and he sold them, they're like $6,000 a piece, but he, they're really comfortable to sit in, they're beautiful designs and they're tactically, tact Tactically? No, tactly. <laughs> With your hands. <laughs> tactile. Yes, tactile sensations on it is really, really amazing. So let's see. Next one would be George Nakashima, also part of the post World War II craft movement. I'm trying to go fast I because I want to get it through a lot. George Nakashima. Um, I really like Nakashima's work because of his use of raw wood slabs, which is really an indication of his reverence for nature and how he wants to show it with clear finishes and how humans interact with nature in our uses of natural materials in our objects that we use in our living spaces. Hans Wegner, he's a mid-century modern designer. I really like the way he is, designs his furniture in that they're really clean lines, they flow well together, there's minimal amount of stuff on it. And so it's just a beautiful, clean furniture that he makes. I just love Wegner's furniture. Soryonagi, this one is one of my favorite stools. This is also post-World War II. This has what, six pieces in it. You don't have to have a lot in your designs in order to make something that is gorgeous. And this is a beautiful stool made from plywood and a couple little pieces in there. This one down here is James Krenoff, who started his own school up in uh, Fort Bragg in Northern California. And he was also part of this post-World War II craft movement. But his attention to the really fine details of the grain of the wood, how the woods go together, the color balances between the different woods, the sizing, the shaping, the quality of uh, technical quality of his uh, manufacturing is uh, bar none. It's really wonderful. Silas Koff, he does um, veneering and marquetry. 
This looks like a cabinet with a door that is open, but that's all wood. The, the goblets are wood, everything inside of it's wood, the shadows are wood. There's hinges, so this does have a door, but I don't think that this is the actual door. I think the door comes over here somewhere like this. So I like Silas Koff's work because technically it's very advanced and beautiful, but he also has this playfulness in his designs that really make you want to get closer and start investigating it. So that's kind of the things that we like as designers is that we want people to interact with the things we create, right? So interior designing is just like product designing or furniture designing in that it's something that people interact with. Um, Judy uh, McKee, uh, was, we saw a show of hers up in Long Beach and she does these pieces of furniture that in, include animals and just the organic nature of it and the liveliness that is in her furniture is just amazing. And it makes you want to come up to them and just like sit in them and play with them and stroke them because they're just so beautiful in their shapes and forms. So anyways, those are my inspirations and influences. So I talk about a little bit about my how I go about designing because I like interacting with the idea of the naturalness of the wood and nature where it comes from. So for example, in my proportioning of things, whoops, whoa, let's go back. Let's try that again. Okay, so simple math ratios, um, one to one, two to one, three to one, four to one in creating shapes. But then there's other math ratios. For example, over here, we have the Hamburg, Hambridge ratio for making drawer, uh, a chest of drawers. And that is a um, done geometrically. There's an arithmetic ratios, one, two, three, four, five, then geometric using compasses and, and right triangles to make this particular ratio here. And this one here is the Fibonacci sequence. That's just even, but this is the Fibonacci sequence. If you don't know what it is, it is this sequence right here. Zero and then one, then one plus zero is one, one plus one is two, two plus one is three, two plus three is five. It's each number, next number in the sequence is the sum of the two numbers before it. Now, if you continue on that, the ratio ends up being one number to the next number is a one to 1.618. And you probably already know this because you're in design school that, whoa, my hand's getting a little tricky there. Um, this is the, called the golden ratio. And we see the golden ratio as well as the Fibonacci sequence in nature all the time. Here's a very simple example in petals on flowers. There's peace lily with one petal, purple wing vine with two, lily with three, buttercups with five, clematis with eight, French marigold with 13, chicory with 21, and you guys, there's faces are on top of that one, so I can't see what that one is. But it continues like that, see? So the Fibonacci sequence is common in nature, and the golden ratio is common in nature. And here's many examples and there's millions more. For example, here's a pineapple. If you go across this way, it's five. This way it's eight. This way it's 13. The ratio of the arm to the hand is an eight to five ratio. This National Geographic sign is a golden rectangle. The Toyota insignia is done with golden rectangles and squares. Then you see it in nature in the seed uh, patterns in sunflowers in pine cones in this cactus. The golden, uh, rectang golden ratio done in terms of uh, arcs creates a, spi a spiral pattern, which is the same as these spiral patterns. You can see it in the ear here, in the shell over here, and you can see here in the Austin Martin, they obviously use the golden ratio in a bunch of different areas in order to make a vehicle that is very pleasing to the eye. And it's used in design everywhere all over the place. So let's get to my philosophy because this is what your philosophy class is about, right? So I have this reverence for natural materials. Nature does it better. Don't fight the wood, just work with what you have and respect the wood. Know it was a living thing, display its good qualities. Uh, I like using clear finishes to highlight what the spirit of the material was and is. And personally, I always try to do my best technical work. I really pray 
pay close attention to the process and the details because I'm always striving for something new. I'm either developing new skills or developing a new look. So I'm always learning. And that's what we have to do as designers. We're always learning how to put things together in new and novel ways or put things together in old ways in, with a new look or using new skills that you've never used before. So whatever you always, I always strive to have the piece be complete, the material and design work together in harmony and in order to create something attractive and useful for what its design is. And most of all, whatever you design, somebody else has already thought of it and be humble. Okay, let's get into some fun type of stuff. This is the first thing I ever made in wood. It was a Palomar College. I made this clock. Everybody made the same kind of clock, but, but you could detail it yourself in any way you wanted. I wanted to make this architectural, so I learned how to turn columns in that same class, which wasn't supposed to be part of the class. And I changed the pediment, the, uh, the top part there, and I put a groove down here to make it a very architectural look. And it came out really nice. And so that got me excited about woodworking. Then later on, when I started to make my own stuff, I got, I like mid-century modern. So this is a mid-century modern clock that I made. And it has a lot of those basic ideas of what mid-century modern design has. It has very um, geometric uh, triangular shaped uh, hands. There's an atomic um, look to these dots using dots instead of numbers is also mid-century modern. Having this starburst pattern is mid-century modern. Clean lines, simple materials. And um, I like how this one came out. It came out really nice because it's got a good color balance to it. And uh, let's see. And I made it just for something different to try. I wanted to see whether I can make it a wall clock as well as a table clock. So I made the back on a hinge with a chain in order to be able to put it on the table. That was fun. This box here, well, this comes from a, a long time ago. My wife, well, not a long time ago, a while back, my wife and I were really getting into steampunk and she's really into computers. I'm really into woodworking. So I bought her this thing right here, okay? And let me go here, I'll stop and share and I'll go to, whoa, where's my, how do I go to my camera? It's under there, isn't it? Whoops. Hmm. I'm not able to go back and forth to my camera right now. Why is that not working? It worked fine. It worked fine. Oh. Just stop share. Just stop share? Yeah. Okay. Because all I can see is a bunch of you guys. Yep. Okay. But I can't see me. There I am. Okay. <laughs> so, anyways, this, I bought this for her. We were into steampunk and I bought this for her and she's into computers. So I went online, I found this from a guy in, in uh, England and there's a little gauge there and a little tank there and little things that move around here. And because she's in computers, it's a flash drive. It's a really cool little flash drive. And so I wanted to make a box for this to store it. So, cause it's you know, kind of fragile with these little pieces on here. So I made that box. So since it's steampunk, I wanted to make a box that looked like it was a steamer chest. So I took a little piece of rosewood and I cut it up. So all the grain still matched when I went, put it back together. And I put little brass pieces on the corners to make it look like a steamer trunk. And it's on a hinge and I bought red velvet on the inside because that looks so Victorian. And there we go. We have a nice little box for our what do they call it, an information cabinet or something like that? Some uh, steampunk name. So that's my first box right there. Right. And because I am, want to you know, respect nature and I also don't want to like use woods that I shouldn't use, this is uh, Indian rosewood, which you shouldn't be using, but it happened to be a piece of wood that I just had around. And this here is supposed to look like ivory, but it's not ivory. I don't want, I won't use ivory because I don't want to kill animals to get ivory. This is from a kukui nut, which is those big black nuts that you have in the Hawaiian lays. Mm -hmm. And it makes really nice uh, material for making small things. And um, so I made that estuncheon out of that. Estuncheon? I think I got that word right. Okay, there's my first box. And there it is with a little 
thingamajig. My second box is this one. This is a music box. Um, I bought a little piece of uh, musical instrument thing that you put in a music box. And I did, was into a Celtic uh, knots at that time. And I was trying to design my own Celtic knots. And so I decided I wanted to make a box with a Celtic knot. And I was trying to get away from re completely rectangular. So I was trying to get these little uh, shaped sides. And I also was trying to figure out if a different way of making a box. So I made the pieces of wood go this way instead of like this. Right, so the pieces are like this, and then I cut through the top. Now, let's see. Oh, get rid of that there. And you can see the musical workings there. And these, each of these slices are cut this way, and then I cut through it this way in order to make the inside match the outside. And it's all very organic looking. And I had that same red velvet, so I put it in there. And and there's a nice little box that I made. So I learned how to carve, which I had never done before. I learned how to figure out how to make non-straight sides. And then I kind of carved around the corners to make the top flow into the sides. And that was a lot of fun. So um, what's next? Oh, this box. Um, in 2005, there was this exhibit called Caution Animals at Work in um, Pauley, Pennsylvania at the Wharton Eshwick Museum. And the competition was that you need to come up with a thing that is animal referencing that is able to do something. So it, it's animals at work, okay? And it's because Eshwick had made something like that and they used that as a jumping off point to have a competition. So I made this. And my idea was that, you know, boxes are, you know, little things that hide special things inside of them, right? Well, sometimes those boxes have locks on them. And so you want to keep them safe, those special things safe. So I thought of, you know, what kind of animal, you know, doesn't want things getting into it. So this is my solution for that. A sea urchin is certainly something you don't want to touch. And if you don't know there's a box in there, you certainly don't want to get into it. You don't want to pick it up. So generally, if you look at that, you don't really want to pick it up. So you don't even know that it is a box. Well, it is a box, okay? This is a copy I made because that one sold and I really liked it, so I wanted to make my own. So here's a different one. It's um, better coloring on it. The other one had pretty much one color, just different tones of the color, but I tried to use different colors in this one. It came out a little bit livelier. So turn it upside down, you can see that there's a box there. This is a five-sided box because sea urchins are five-sided animals like sand dollars and starfish. So I had to make a five-sided box for that. And it sits so low that you can't even see it. Now, it's a box and it's got a lock. What's the easiest way of making a lock? One of these pins is a lock. I have to figure out which pin it is in order to unlock it so I can open the box. Now, luckily, since I made this, I know which pin it is. Out. This one right here, and that allows the box to come out. Wow. So <laughs> it's just a little five sided box. And just for fun, I carved the inside of the box um, just to give it some texture. That's made out of, I don't know what that's made out of right now. Um, but, anyways, there's a box with a lock. It's an animal doing a job, working. <laughs> and it was very fun. So it's fun to do things for, you know, like a competition like that, because then you end up thinking outside of the box of what you would normally want to create on your own. So that's all part of the learning process is just to, you know, constantly keep your eye out for new and different things to do. And the next box here, this is a box I made for my in-laws for anniversary. And um, most things a person designs is things that you have an idea, you do drawings and sketches of them, you refine the drawings and sketches, you start building and then you say, that's not gonna work. And so you do something else and it's slightly different. And then you sometimes go back to drawing, sometimes you go to models and you know all the design process that you guys are learning about now. 
This box here is a different kind of a box. This box is I started with the materials and I tried to see what the materials were gonna tell me in order to try to create something interesting and fun. So I started with this top, which is this piece of Zebrano known for its light and dark striping. Mm -hmm. And I decided, okay, I'm gonna make a box out of this. So I found a uh, wood that goes well with it, which is this uh, Jatoba. And then I used holly in this little, in the corners, because I said, oh, I want some little detailing in the corners, because nobody ever details the corners in a original boring square box. And then I said, okay, I want something different on the top as a handle because it's just a square box. It's gonna be kind of boring just as a square box. And like, you know, a lot of jewelry boxes that people make are just, you know, boring square boxes. The reason I made this handle the way it is, is you can kind of see it right there. And you can see it right there. This is a little circle. Mm -hmm. Sobrano is known for stripy grain. Mm -hmm. To have a circle in it is very unusual. So I made the handle like that in order to make it look like it's dropping down there and dripping water like in a cave and making that little end to that little circle. So it kind of draws the eye to that little tiny detail that normally people wouldn't pay attention to. So let me show you the actual box because I don't think I have any other good pictures. So here's the box and you can see right there, there's that little dot. And so since this is a box I did not really design on paper, I just started putting it together and trying to figure out what colors go good together. So I put a tray in it and I put the same shape here as the shape of the handle to make the outside and the inside come together better. It's probably like a jewelry chest tray, uh, a box or something like that. So I've used the brown on the inside just to like the outside. I made the sides of a contrasting wood. And then I put a grid on the inside to, for the bottom part for earrings or whatever. And I tried to make these pieces as thin as possible in order to challenge myself to see whether I could do it. And I obviously did. And <laughs> these little corners here, which you can kind of see or cut out, ended up accidentally like that, even though it looks kind of cool, looks like a cloud lift, a, a arts and craft cloud lift. It turned out because I had made this box with a slope here. I wanted to see if I could make a box with a slope here and see what kind of problem that would cause for me. So I made that and then I made the lid for it, but the lid didn't fit great. It would, it would sit on there a little bit crooked like that because it didn't, the top didn't get glued together like the bottom got glued together. So I ended up having to put little alignment pegs there, which ended up running into that tray. So I had to cut out the corners of the tray. It came out good. I solved a little problem. I never would have thought of that as a design concept or design detail, but it came out interesting. So sometimes your designs don't turn out the way you want them to, but they still turn out good. So if you get into trouble, just keep going forward. You will solve that problem. And sometimes it comes out good. This box. Now, the Jewish holiday weekend is um, ends on Sunday, I think. I'm sorry, I don't know this very well. But the ceremony that you have on Sunday is you light a candle for some reason, you um, do something else for some reason, you drink wine for some reason. And it, these are all ceremonial things. And this thing is a spice box that you're supposed to have spices in and you open it up and smell it in order to understand your mortality and your senses and your thankfulness that God has created these wonderful things for you. So I, this is since being a ceremonial box, I had to make this really, really carefully because I wanted it to be something, because it's something you interact with. You, I want it to be something that is very well made. So this box looks like it might be pretty big, but it is actually this big. Wow. It's very small. Mm -hmm. And so I took a while trying to figure out how I was going to make this box. And so I did a lot of drawings. And as you can see, it is a golden rectangle. And that is a square. It's actually a cube. And then adding this part makes it into a golden rectangle. So I used 
high quality materials. I used a really nice um, burl veneer for here. And this black wood is ebony, which is CITES um, endangered species wood that you cannot get this anymore. And only woods they can get are pretty much just little offcut pieces. And that's why I have so little of it in here. I have a few other pieces, but I don't ever use them unless I want to use it for something extremely special. So this being ceremonial, I wanted to use it. And then I put these little veneer pieces in between and I had to cut it in such a way. This is made in such a way that it's made like this and I cut it apart after the box is made. So after putting all this work into this box, I had to cut it up. Wow. So it was really nerve wracking to try to make this box at the end. And you had to cut the a cut on the inside of this box before you glued it up. And then you had to know where that cut was on the inside before you cut the box apart. So in order to be able to have this cut apart just perfectly so that it would close like that. Wow. And because I could not put this circle in beforehand, I made the circle afterwards because I wanted it to be a full circle instead of a partial circle that was cut. Mm -hmm. So this is made from ebony and this burl, what I forget it is, I think it's olive burl. And this is a uh, quilted maple and the white is holly and the inside's just bare. But it smells good. Ceremonial box, but takes a lot of work because I wanted to make it really, really fine. And it came out very nice. Mm -hmm. Even if I say so myself. <laughs> <laughs> modesty, modesty. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, this box I don't have here. Um, this is a box I was making because I was working on my technical skills. I wanted to see if I could make a box with very thin walls because mm -hmm. making a box with thin walls is not that hard if you're making a square box, but I wanted to make a non-square box with thin walls. So what I did was I used this really beautiful um, fiddleback maple veneer and I made a teardrop shaped form to form it around and glue the, the Laminate, uh, laminates together. And so it was just sort of a practice box to see whether I could, that, the, that I could do this as, a, as an idea. So I made a form and I had this idea that part of the form was going to be the bottom of the box because I knew that the shape of this outside was gonna end up being exactly the shape of the form. So I made the bottom layer of the form, the bottom of the box. And I just ended up <laughs> cutting off the bottom of the form. So it fit inside this box perfectly and I could glue it right in and there's no gaps and it's beautiful. This piece was cut out separately and uh, because of the way I had made this shape, I had to somehow make it connect over here. And just for fun, I, was, I got this idea that I was gonna make uh, shoestrings to hold this end together. And I thought shoestrings was kind of lame in terms of a look. So I got this, this blast of uh, idea where I had this copper wire. So I used copper wire to run through here and it's malleable enough that I could run it through all here and make a bow, tie, bow knot and tighten it up and make it all perfect and then smooth it out because it's malleable enough that I could take out the kinks. So it came out pretty cool and I like that. Mm -hmm. And this little lit uh, part here with, this is apricot. And let's see, see there's a close up of the knot and here's the back, the way they go through. So I made it nice front and back. And this little piece here is my favorite part of the whole thing. It's the shape of this whole box, but mm -hmm. it's got so much grain and stuff going through this little tiny piece, this little tiny piece that's about that big mm -hmm. has more going on it than the entire rest of the box. So I love that. <laughs> I guess I'm a, I'm a wood junkie. Um, okay, let's get into, away from boxes for now. We have these, um, okay, I got time. We got these uh, growing in our yard. These are just like osteospermums. That's their scientific name, but they're known as freeway daisies. They're all over the freeways and everything. And it's really pretty little flower, even though they're everywhere. And I just like the, the looks of them. And I thought, you know, what can I make out of that? That would be really interesting, but different. So what I thought was, well, that's round. 
tables are round. So I made a table and I put it in the San Diego Fine Woodworkers Show at the fair back in 2005. And this is the table that I came up with. And so these are formed veneer laminates like plywood. And there's 17 of them, so it's not a Fabinici number, but um, I tried using a prime number, so I used 17 instead. Um, and it came out nice. I got second place in the art furniture um, comp uh, category, um, but I was, it was a bitch. Excuse my French. Um, the leaves, sitting on the bottom part down here didn't all sit evenly. So I had to remake this bottom part and inside underneath this center part, I've got this mechanical thing that is able to lift each one of those pedals independently so they could all lean up, line up perfectly in order to hold the, the top flat. Wow. <laughs> so it started out being, oh, this is a nice little easy project. And then I ended up making this really complicated thing underneath here in order to make it all line up perfectly. But it came out really tight. nice. Mm -hmm. I liked it. Wow. The problem was that these things were not strong enough and I couldn't figure out how to fix the problem with these not being strong enough. And, you know, they looked nice and they were nice and thin like petals, but the top, if you put stuff on it, it got a little wiggly a little easily. So you couldn't really use it very well as a table. So I took it apart eventually, <laughs> even though it's one uh, award, it, I took it apart. Okay, hmm. this is a bedside table that I have. How much longer should I go? Um, I think we're we're good for you know another ten minutes, um, and then maybe we can still take questions after that. Okay, if anybody yeah, have fine. questions, just ask. Yeah, the bedside table that I made to go with the bed that I made, and um, I wanted something that could hold books because my wife reads a lot of books, and I read lots of books and magazines, and I wanted also to have storage. Well, I didn't want to have a big drawer up here because that wouldn't leave you room for books here. So I wanted to have high space on either side. And then, so I decided on having the drawers in the center with opening, excuse me, opening on either side for books because I tend to have larger books than normal because I have woodworking books. Mm -hmm. And so I was working on making curved legs, which I'd never done before. And that turned out to be a bit of a technical uh, issue. And I wanted a curved front and I wanted to have recessed uh, part for my handles. And so I made these oval and I hand carved those. And I'd never done that before when I did this. And it came out really nice. Mm -hmm. I was very happy with it. Um, and it seems to have a good balance of positive and negative space. Mm -hmm. And this being in the center, I was thinking of possibly putting the drawers on one side and the other one on the other side so that when they're sitting on opposite sides of the bed, they would be. Uh, mirror images of each other, but I didn't particularly like that. I wanted to have closer access to this and I made it symmetrical instead. And I think it turned out rather well that way. And there we go, a bedside table that I made. This is a cabinet on stand I made that's sitting in my kitchen right now. It's from a class at Palomar where it was a hand tool class. So this is all handmade. And I was really working hard on this one to try to make the grain patterns match and the wood um, the woods match in terms of their, their colors and their their contrasts so this these are book match a book match piece of uh, butternut that you saw right down the middle and you open it up like this and it's two matching mirrored pieces and that's how you get uh, book match pieces like that but paying close attention to the details as I made this, I decided this, this grain I wanted to come across here. So this is all made out of one piece of, of wood that I cut in the middle. These two are the same. These two are from one piece of wood. And I had to lay this out so that the grain ran exactly across here instead of you know just cutting it out of wherever out of the board and having the grain go every which way. So as furniture designers, you have to take into account the grain, the color, the working properties of the materials you're working with, as well as the normal things that you would as a designer, the color balance, the, the shades, the positive negative spaces and all those things. 
And let's see, is there another picture of this? Yeah, this is the reason I got this board, this, this uh, big wide board that has a bark inclusion right there. And when this thing was new, this, this was like purple and red and blue and orange and all kinds of really cool colors in here. But unfortunately, it faded to all about the same color. And hand tool class, I these uh, dovetails pattern is up here and dovetail pattern down here, putting it together. There are different patterns up here and down here. So I had to be very careful when I was cutting these to make sure that I was cutting the top part here and the bottom part here, and the right side here, and the left side there. And just, I was just absolutely nuts, crazy trying to make this thing with all these little details that I wanted to put in this. So there's dovetailed drawers and yeah, so it turned out really cool. Recently, I took this class at Palomar to make something that was completely outside of the box, which, you know, a, a musical instrument. It's not just something you interact with and, you know, put down, right? This is something that makes noise and it's not square. So it was like, you know, how are we going to make this? Luckily, my friend was teaching a class, so I could like text him all the time to try to get answers to all my questions because being a woodworker is one thing, but being a woodworker making stuff like this is completely a different thing. So everybody made the same thing, but you could do your own little details on it. Like you could do the, the bridge here and the bottom of the um, neck, the soundboard, as well as the shape of the head. So that's what I did. I put my own little stamp on it. So I made this with a tulip shape with a curve on the end. And I mirrored that curve right here with a little flare, which was a pain in the butt because these edges had to be just so. And I also put it down here. So, you know, I made it my own. And whoops, oh, I thought I had a back, there it is. And there's a close up of the head and there's a picture of the back. Those are also book matched pieces. And that was a lot of fun. This is koa, beautiful wood, gorgeous wood. I love working with it. This is rosewood, and that's made of rosewood, and the neck is mahogany. And yeah, that was great. It even sounded good when I was done. Because the putting the neck onto the body is a real finicky process. And if you don't do it right, the musical instrument sounds like some other musical instrument, like something weird. And luckily, I made it right, and it came out good. These are little things I do just because I need them, you know, for cooking in the kitchen, you need tools and it's a little project. It just takes a few hours and it gives you an idea like, okay, what can I make really quick that, you know, comes out pretty. Um, we are looking at here. This is our library. My wife likes Victorian things. So we got this chair that's Victorian looking and our bookshelves are like from Ikea and they're like, you know, modernist. So she wanted a uh, footstool. So I kind of combined the two together. I made a modern looking footstool with a tapestry <laughs> padded top to it. It came out pretty good. It kind of goes, kind of blends it all together in an interesting way. There's a clock that I made that was nice. I made it for my wife. Uh, a box. I wanted to see if I can make a box with a curved side. And so it came made it with two opposing curved sides and ended up calling it a galaxy box. And this is from the same plum tree that I made the handle for that other box and then other boxes that I've made. And that's it. 